Joining us right now, uh, Foreign Policy uh, Initiative co-founder, former White House advisor, Dan Senor. He's co-authored a new book about Israel's re uh, resilience. It's called The Genius of Israel, and um, the timing could have not been more auspicious, perhaps. Um, it's nice to see you. Good to see you. So, so where are, let's, we, we, I want to talk about the book, but yeah. I, I want to talk about sort of where we, where you think we really are and in where you war. think this, where, yes, where, where you think we really are in this war, where you think it's really headed and what you think of actually what Bibi Netanyahu just said about this idea that he plans to keep security forces there. Some people have described that as an, as an occupation and the like. Yeah. So first of all, uh, first of all, I think October 7th, and I was on the show with you guys yep. 48 hours after, um, the trauma is difficult to overstate for the country. This is a worse setback for this country at any time in its history, going back to the 1973 Yom Kippur War. And I, would, I can make the argument that it's even worse than that. Not only because the war doesn't end, in that there's still over 230 hostages in, uh, in these tunnels in Gaza. These parents, you know, th over 30 kids. Yonit Levy, who's a news anchor in, uh, in Israel for Channel 12, just sent out something this morning of the images of these 30 plus children. These parents, you know, as, as the war goes on, 30 days is a long time for a nine-month-old to be without their parents. Now, that nine-month-old is a 10-month-old. So it's just, so it's the, the national trauma is difficult to overstate. That said, we've seen two things happen. One, resilience, which we'll, I think we'll talk about, which is the country has come together in ways that one could not have imagined on October 6th when Israel was dealing with the depths of division. So it's been rallying across all sectors, and it gives people a lot of hope about how the country's rallying citizens volunteering right. fill, filling important government roles that have been absent and the war when you talk to folks who are involved in senior levels of the security infrastructure again i, I want to be careful here because all war fighting is always fragile it's always going well until it isn't uh, but the commanders and the civilian um, uh, leaders on the national security front are cautiously optimistic that they are making a lot of progress that they are actually moving right. deeper and deeper deep into the hamas territory in gaza now to your question this was sprung on Israel on October 7th, right? People call for a ceasefire. There was a ceasefire with Hamas. There was a ceasefire on October 6th. It ended on October 7th. So Israel was surprised by this. Israel has to get rid of Hamas out of Gaza. What follows Gaza? What follows Hamas in Gaza? Israel doesn't know. So at a minimum, there's just going to have to be an interim period where Israel's security forces are present in Gaza to keep some calm. I don't think Prime Minister Netanyahu or anyone in Israel wants to reoccupy Gaza. They left, the, they left Gaza in 2005. Right. They do not want to be back there, but they, they, there's no easy handoff, you know, the moment this war ends. When do you think it ends? How long do you think this goes on for? And what do you think about the public reaction around the world? Because it really does feel that there is, uh, frankly, not a lot of support for what Israel is doing right now. Yeah. Uh, I think the operation in Gaza will go on for months. Uh, I, I obviously can't give you a precise time, but it'll go for months. It, a lot will depend on when the, the commanders of uh, Hamas are killed. The Yoav Gallant, the defense minister, has said if the Palestinians want this to end sooner, they can go take out the commanders of Hamas. Like, Israel doesn't have to do it. That's the quickest way to end this war. So, you know, I just think months. And I think Israel's in this impossible situation, which at any moment, a second front, a third front, a fourth front. So the front in the north with Hezbollah could open up. Nasrallah, the head of uh, Hezbollah, gave a speech last week which he basically sig signaled he has no intention in the near term to get involved. That can right. change. I mean, Dan, in the background of all this is Iran. Yeah. And, and with all their uh, troublemaking, which it, it's every day, just yeah. about. Well, they're the yeah, they're, they're so are we, central function What do here. we need to do in terms of, I mean, it's a weird one. I are just, they calculated troublemakers is the question. But our response is, we, we say, the president says don't, and that's all we hear. I mean, what, what should we, and, and our military response has been anemic yeah. at, at this point. Yeah. What, what do we need to do? Can we stop? Anything? Will I, they I, listen? I, you remember when we took out Soleimani? Yeah. They didn't do anything. They, they shut everything. They didn't do anything. Yeah, no, I think they time. completely caught off guard. I think uh, Iran and Hamas thought two things. One, they thought by having these 230 plus hostages, it would slow Israel's, it would create some reticence on behalf of Israel in terms of how quickly they went into Gaza. Israel went right into Gaza. So I think that caught them off guard. And I think the U.S. military assets that have been deployed to the region have also spooked Tehran and Hezbollah because they're considerable resources. Now, the question is, do we use those resources? But they're there, and that alone has it's given them... be a red line such... But, well, but, I, but to, to get to your point, Joe, at the end of the day, you talk to Israeli leaders, and they say, we can deal with Hamas. We can deal with Hezbollah. Yeah. We can deal with increasing radicalization in the West Bank. 
But until we deal with Iran, this doesn't end. Israel is surrounded on all its borders by these genocidal actors, and they're being or architected by Tehran, by Iran, which is the ultimate genocidal actor who literally calls for Israel to be wiped off the map. And so I think Israel re realizes the world in which they just have some coexistence with Iran and they just kind of learn to live with Iran's existence and sort of containment is not going to so work. So you're satisfied with the Biden administration's response to what's So Iran far, is? yes, in that I, I would hope that they would be a little more aggressive towards Iran, but at the end of the day, the president has made it clear he stands by Israel. He went to Israel. He met with the war cabinet during a war and he's deployed a lot of military assets. that bomb and then what? Did right. So that, that's my point. That's why Israel thinks they're going to have to deal with Iran. I mean, so your your thought is that this absolutely spreads and turns into an entire Middle East war? It, I know. I don't say that with certainty. I just think that Israel, the idea that it could indefinitely live with containment of Iran as a long-term strategy is unsustainable. And, the, and most Israeli leaders believe that. Now, whether or not that turns into a regional war tomorrow, you know, I don't, I don't think it will be. I don't right. think it will. But I think... Speak to, the, yeah. speak to, though, the blowback, yeah. the, the global blowback. To, to the way Israel is handling this, because I think that also is going to ha have an impact not just on Israel, but by the way, it's having a, on the conversation that we're having at universities around the country, oh, yeah. on uh, the Jewish people or yeah. around the world. Yeah. I will tell you, as a Jew and as the son of a Holocaust survivor and as uh, someone who's raising two children who go to a Jewish day school, uh, so this is separate from all my family that lives in Israel. I'm just talking about my life here. I grew up with all these stories about the Holocaust, and I grew up, my mother was on the run as a little girl in Eastern Europe. I, I was very familiar with all the stories, but I never felt vulnerable. I never felt the vulnerability that she feels. This is the first time in my life, I'm in my early 50s, that I've ever felt vulnerable because there is real anti-Semitic violence against Jews. And there used to people say, oh, yeah, there's a distinction. You can criticize Israel and not be anti-Semitic. But why is it when things get hot in Israel, when Israel's on the receiving end of a genocidal attack and it must respond, the, the, re the response from organizations here, whether they're on college campuses or protesters in the streets, is to just go get Jews and attack Jews and mobs attacking Jews. And the language they use, from the river to the sea, which is about wiping out the Jews, you don't have to read between the lines on that language. I will tell you, it is... It, it, is, it makes me feel very vulnerable. I know a lot of Jews feel this way right. in ways that we've never felt before.